like we're running. Sorry for the delay. Uh, our friend Tom is really struggling right now. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for all you do. and Thank you for your word and help us as we open your word and study today. But This morning we lift up Tom. He's really, really struggling. He needs your help. And we don't actually know what to do. We give him the help he needs, Lord. Thank you for all you do. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're starting a new book today. The book of Colossians. Which was written by Paul. And maybe Timothy had something to do with it. Because it says in the very beginning, it's from Paul and Timothy. Right? Um, to the church at Colossae. And you might wonder where Colossae is. <laughs> and I don't know if it's on our map. Let me see. It might it's right be. right there, isn't it? Huh? It's right there. Maybe it's here. Right here. Hmm. It's about 100 miles from Ephesus. Next to Laodicea. Right. So, it used to be, uh, previously was a uh, quite a thriving city, but Laodicea and the one north of that, uh, Hariopolis, whatever it's pronounced, <laughs> became much bigger city. Right. Interesting about this letter. This epistle, written by Paul to the church at Colossae, is Paul was never at Colossae, that we know of. Somebody else, who apparently heard Paul at Ephesus, and then went back to Colossae and started the church there. Right? And then he brings word to Paul about what's going on there, Right? And when he's in Rome, right, in the uh, house arrest, you know, chained to a Roman guard, or I, more accurately, the Roman guard that came to him, <laughs> right? Now, he uh, wrote this letter because there were some, as always, false teachers, right, trying to mess people up. So he's getting the message back to them. Okay, it was written probably around A.D. 61 in that area, 60, 61, 62. We don't know exactly, but that's the time frame where we think Paul was in this first Roman arrest, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, it's interesting. Because this book, Colossians, as it says in my Bible here, that Colossians is perhaps the most Christ-centered book in the Bible. It's for, for evangelism and everything like that. Well, it's, it's yes, but it's, it's meant to reinforce what they were taught, who Christ is. Right, because people are coming in. You know, the Jews are saying, "Oh, well, you, you know, you still got to obey this Jewish laws, or, or you, you know, you still got these Greek gods over here. You got to pay attention to this." Or they're even saying that, you, "Well, you need to worship these angels too." All this, all this stuff, right? It's just like today. There's so many deviations. Of Christianity, you know, where people are worshiping all kinds of things, including Mother Earth, right? When we're supposed to worship the Creator, mm -hmm. not the creation, mm -hmm. right? Or some fabrication of the human mind <laughs> because they don't want to be accountable to God. Bottom line. But anyway. As it says, but Christ, the Lord of creation, the head of the body, which is the church, 
is completely sufficient for every spiritual and practical need of the believer, right? That's in these comments about uh, Colossians in the first part of this. My uh, New American Standard Study Edition, the Open Bible, has this in front of every book has a section that goes into all these details about the, that particular letter. It helps out a lot to kind of get things in perspective. And, uh, you know, I've got the Beeler Bible. And, <laughs> well, and, it's a Beeler Bible. I, I, I like it it's a BB. <laughs> it was a big print. Yeah. And then, of course, when I read, Well, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To be an apostle, you had to have an actual face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus, right? Did you already take your back? Yes, ma'am. Put it on the camera. Right? And... When was Paul's face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus? <laughs> On the road to right. Damascus. <laughs> right? right? Apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, so from Paul, right, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father. From God, our Father. Right? What does it mean to be a saint? To be saved. Yeah. It means you're a Christian. You're part of the family. Right? You know, so, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All three again. Right? Our Lord. <laughs> this is God. Jesus. Also human. Right? Christ the Messiah. Right? Who saves? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord God who comes as Messiah and saves us. All in that phrase. Praying prayers for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all saints. Okay? Now we're going to find out a little bit later how he's heard. But what's interesting to me here is your faith in Christ Jesus and the love. You know, there's different Greek words for love. This is agape. God's love. Unconditional. Expecting nothing in return. Just love. We don't often hear of people attributed this phrase. Yeah. Pretty rare. Yeah. Right? You have agape love. Because of the hope, in verse 5, laid up for you in heaven. Now, biblical hope is not, oh, I sure hope it, I sure wish it happens, right? Mm -hmm. Biblical hope is assurance. Mm -hmm. Right? As the songs say, blessed assurance. <laughs> right? of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. What is the word of truth? The gospel. gospel. What is the gospel? The word of God. The word of God. Jesus Christ, God himself, becomes a man, right? Suffers and dies on the cross to pay the price for our sins. And that's why he is trying to stress to them yeah. that he had to suffer. Well, he's, but he's stressing here who Jesus is, yeah. right? He's not any of these creations. Right, because... He's not a fabrication of your mind. Because when he was a Sanhedrin or a Pharisee or whatever he was... He was a Pharisee. It, it was just, that was not the way they thought the Messiah was going to be. 
No, so. no, he was going to be the conquering hero, right? Which Jesus was, but in a way that they never imagined. Yeah, exactly. Even though it was explained in detail in the Bible, in the Old Testament, <laughs> right? Right. In several places, <laughs> right? Daniel, Psalms, Isaiah, it's all detailed out exactly how Christ would come, would suffer and die. In Daniel, it says he would be cut off or killed, <laughs> right? And tells you exactly when it's going to happen. <laughs> But they didn't, you know, that was just too far from their ability to comprehend. And I understand that. I mean, the idea that God would die. <laughs> yeah. That's just, they just said, just no, that can't happen. <laughs> right? So they didn't get it. But this is the gospel. And he's stressing this, that God himself became a man and paid the price for your sin. And now you can have agape love, right? All right? Which has come to you, the gospel, the word of truth, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. You know, Paul and the other apostles are all out, and they're converting, and people are becoming Christians, and they're going out, right? And they're converting, and, and you know, uh, People are becoming Christians, and they're going out. And their people are spreading all over the world, right? Bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you, right? Their church is growing. They're, they're understanding. They're telling other people the church is growing in Colossus, right? Since the day you heard of it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Did they deserve to be saved? No. By the grace of God, they were saved. By the grace of God, I am saved. I don't deserve it. I'm a sinner. I'm like Paul. I'm a chief sinner. <laughs> right? But by the grace of God, I'm saved. Only by the grace of God. <laughs> no other reason. There's no other explanation. And it's true for all of us. That's right. Right? Just as you learned it from Epaphras. <laughs> if you ever know how to pronounce it. Epaphras. Right? He's a guy, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on your behalf. <laughs> right? He learned and became a Christian, apparently at Ephesus, went back to Colossae, started a church. And then brought word of the church to Paul, probably at Ephesus to begin with, but then now he brings word to Paul in Rome. Okay? And he also informed us of your love in the spirit right that they have this very special love right god's kind of love in verse 9 for this reason also since the day we heard of it we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, what's wisdom? The proper application of knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, they want, he's saying that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, how do we get God's, how do we get filled with God's type of knowledge? Well, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Exactly. The Holy Spirit. And we don't have the Holy Spirit until we get saved. Right. Once we confess and make Jesus our Lord, we're filled with the Spirit. Now, all these good things can start to happen, and we can make wise decisions, have wisdom. And have discernment, right. Because 
we know the truth. Can you make wise decisions if you don't know the truth? <laughs> Let's make a, a, a drastic example. In Tom's current condition, can he make a wise decision? Because no. he doesn't know anything about truth at the moment. Right. He's not coherent. You know, things are all confused. Right. You know, all the wires are crossed. <laughs> Something really goofy is going on. Yeah. Right. Well, can anybody make a wise decision if you don't understand God, if you don't know truth? Now, you think you can based on all the knowledge you've collected. Right. But can you really? If you don't know the truth, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> right? right? If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the truth. Right. And you're stuck in a uh, paradigm of making unwise decisions because you have no foundation. He's making this point to them. Now, he knows they have it, right? They can make wise decisions. So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Walk is your way of life, right? The way you live your life. Are you living your life in a way or manner worthy of the Lord? Who did what for you? Everything, <laughs> right? To please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Right? If you know the truth and you're communicating on a, shall we say, a spiritual level, right? I heard people lately, the last several months, talking about being on the fifth dimension, right? The fifth dimension. And what they're trying to say is that you're on a level where you're loving people, caring about people, being self-sacrificing, you know, not being selfish. That's the third dimension. <laughs> and that's the way they describe it. Right? Hmm. Well, I call it having the truth. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you know Jesus. Right? Strengthen, by the way, this is all one sentence. Paul likes to write through the most, the most complicated sentences. <laughs> right? <laughs> Strengthened with period. all power, mm -hmm. according to his glorious might. Right? And who does the strengthening? Yeah, his other self, the Holy Spirit. Right? Three personages. See that? Three personages. One God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's all one God. Right? Strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might. Right? In other words, the Holy Spirit is strengthening you for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience gloriously, joyously, excuse me, joyously, right? In other words, while we're doing the things we're doing because we're extending our love, how often is love returned? Frequently not, Yeah. right? So sometimes being steadfast in patience is difficult. But he's saying if we're connected with God, we can still do it joyously. Mm -hmm. so we learn back in Philippians several times, <laughs> be joyous, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say rejoice, right? <laughs> you know, he's saying we can do that. Giving thanks, Right? Like it says, tells us to give thanks in all things, not for all things, 
But then also, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. <clears throat> why do we are why are we qualified to share in the inheritance? Because of Jesus. Exactly. Not because of anything that we've done. Because of Jesus. Jesus has done it all. Right? Now we share in the inheritance. <laughs> In light, which to me would be maybe in heaven, <laughs> but it starts, you know, our walk with with God, our walk, our eternity with God begins the moment we accept Jesus, not after we die here on earth. The moment you accept Jesus, you are now in heaven. You're now with Christ for all eternity. Right? That's already started. For he, <laughs> mine says, delivered us. Right? He delivered us from the domain of darkness. The actual Greek is like, he dragged us out. <laughs> <laughs> right? From the domain of darkness. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Right? In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. <laughs> We've been redeemed. You know, to the Hebrew, redeem is like, I went and bought this slave in freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? He's been redeemed from slavery. We were bound in slavery to sin and death. Jesus redeemed us. He paid the price, right? And that redemption gives us what? Forgiveness of sins. My sins are forgiven. Praise God. Because <laughs> there are a bunch of them. <laughs> right? Praise God. My sins are forgiven. Then he goes into, again, talking about Christ. For he, Jesus, is the image, in other words, one in the same, is one in the same of the invisible God. See, we could see Jesus when he was here because he came as a man. Visible. The Father and the Holy Spirit are both invisible. Spiritual. But Jesus, one in the same, was the invisible. The firstborn of all creation. What does that mean? Does that mean that as I say, the other people didn't weren't born before him? Right? If you read in the book of John, right? Chapter one, verse one. John one one. In the beginning. <laughs> was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Right? He was in the beginning with God. So Jesus has always been. When he was born as a man, it wasn't his creation. It was him becoming a man. Right? Right? Whereas we weren't created until he created us. The earth wasn't here until Jesus created it. <laughs> the angels didn't exist until Jesus created them. None of the galaxies were there until Jesus created them. He has always been with God and was God, right? Verse 3, all things came into being by him. All things. All things. Not a few, no exceptions, all things, right? And apart from him, nothing 
came into being that has come into being. <laughs> Is that pretty clear? <laughs> All things, right? And we get that basically repeated here. For by him, all things were created. Verse 16, back in Colossians chapter 1. Right? Both in the heavens and on the earth. All things created by him. Visible and invisible. Does that leave anything out? No. <laughs> right? All things. Whether it's visible or invisible, whether it's in the heavens, whether it's on the earth, no matter where it is, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him, by Jesus, and for him. God created me for him. That answers the question is, why does he love us? Why did he suffer and die for me? He created me for him. Along with everybody else, <laughs> right? And everything else that he created. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. There's a lot of things about quantum physics. Well, there's almost everything about quantum physics that I don't understand. I've never studied it. Right? Yeah. But we know there's some, some sort of force that's holding things together. Uh -huh. Well, I think it's called Jesus. <laughs> it says right here. Yeah, <laughs> he holds all things together, right? He is the head of the body. Now we're moving to the church, right? All of us believers together would be called the church, right? He is the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the most important, right? I mean, what would your body do without your head to guide it? Mm -hmm. Not a darn thing, right? <laughs> you know? So that he himself might come to have first place in every thing right he is first position <laughs> regardless of the you know situation in the church in creation right jesus is preeminent and it does us a lot of good to remember that especially when we start Focusing so much on what we have, what we want, you know, putting ourselves first instead of Him first, right? For it was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness to dwell in Him. That dwell is permanent. Permanently dwell, right? And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. What, what paid the price for our sins? As the song says, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus did it. It's his blood on the cross, right? Through him, I say whether the things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Right? All things. Reconcile. Now that's interesting because we don't often think about that. The other things <laughs> are reconciled to God because of the blood of Jesus. Right. All things. Not just us humans and our sin. All things. You know, we have uh, goofy nature, storms and tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of stuff that happen, you know, all because of the sin of man. But through the reconciliation with Jesus, all of that clears up, mm -hmm. right? It's all reconciled to him. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile, at war, <laughs> you know, in your mind, engaged in evil deeds, you know, when you don't know 
Jesus, when you don't have that knowledge, you don't have the truth, right? You're basically at war with God. But because of Jesus, you can be reconciled and redeemed. Yet, he has now reconciled you, he's talking to the, the Christians, and in this case, the church at Colossae, right? In his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. You know, they talk about when you stand before God the Father, we have the righteousness of Christ. That's what God the Father sees. He took away our sin. He got our sin. We got his righteousness. So we can fellowship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, right? You know, because of what Jesus has done for us, right? And in verse 23, it says if, but it's that Greek if then that's assured, right? Because, mm -hmm. indeed, you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. You know, some people will say, oh, that means I could lose my salvation? No. Because you have continued, right? None of this other stuff is possible, right? You are in the faith. Christ has you, right? Which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister, <laughs> right? And people wonder about that. There's so many verses that talk about eternal security, right? Ephesians 1, John 6, 28, John 6, 37, John 10, 27, 2 Timothy 2, Romans 8, 38, 39, you know, the Bible is very clear. Once saved, always saved. <laughs> Period. Right? No question about that. So people who misconstrue that little piece, of, you know, people like to pull things out of the scripture to make their argument yeah. without looking at... To make their own denomination. Sometimes to make their own denomination. Right? Because of their own ego, which means they don't know the truth. They don't really know Jesus. And that's Paul's point to the Christians at Colossae, right? The letter of Colossians is, know Jesus. Did you see who I told you who he was? <laughs> he is the Lord God Almighty, the creator of everything. <laughs> he created it all for himself. <laughs> when, you know, when you take it to the personal level, you know, Jesus created me for him. It creates a, a bond between him and me that's unbreakable. As soon as I accept his tremendous sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ, and my sins are now forgiven, so the, the tremendous cavern between me and God is now closed because of what Jesus did for me. He created me, you know, uh, Ben Mosley did a sermon one time about a little boy that built this boat. And I forget how he lost it, but he ended up finding it in a shop. And then he had to buy it. See, not only made it, but he bought it. Mm -hmm. Jesus made us, and he bought us with his blood. <laughs> right? That is our lesson in Colossians chapter 1. Father in heaven, as always, thank you for your word. Thank you for, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for creating us. <laughs> Without you, we wouldn't even be here. Thank you for paying the price for our sins. So we are now united with you for all eternity. And as always, Lord, I pray anybody who hears this word, your word, who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, that today would be their day, that they would say, I need Jesus also. Come into my heart and make me a Christian. 
one of yours make allow me to make you Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior may they do that today Lord in the name of Jesus I pray amen that is our lesson in chapter 1 of Colossians God bless and have a great week